Well, welcome everybody to Thought Leader Friday with our friend Stephanie Lanier of the Inspiration Lab. Uh, Stephanie and Debbie go way back, so I'm going to hand it to Debbie to do a brief little intro, Stephanie, and then uh, we'll turn the stage over to her. Take it away, Debbie. Yeah, so welcome, Stephanie, to Thought Leader Friday. Um, Stephanie, Stephanie and I met actually on a bus to a governmental tour, I believe, with uh, the, the uh, North Carolina Realtors Association um, when I was in Wilmington, maybe my first uh, couple of months. So um, she took me under her wing and we've had a friendship since then. I've been able to watch her grow from afar with the Inspiration Lab and all that she's done in her business too. Um, so super excited about having Stephanie here and um, she's going to share with us um, a little bit about her story, the Inspiration Lab and lots of things that they're doing that way um, to add value to just the work-life balance of everything. So I'll just turn it over to you, Stephanie, to introduce yourself and start us into your story and, and what you want to share with us today. Great. Thank you guys so much for having me. I appreciate it. Sure. So um, Debbie and I talked a little bit about um, starting off with my story and sort of background. And so the good news is I'm a realtor, like all of you guys. And so um, that's um, been sort of the story of my life for the past about eight years. But I, <clears throat> I want to back it up and tell you sort of uh, a few things from the beginning. I grew up in North Carolina, in Concord, North Carolina, 10 acres of land out in the country. Um, I went to UNCW for undergrad and graduate school. I actually have a master's degree in social work. Um, and I think now in my life, I see how it all fit, is fitting together. But at the time when I transitioned to real estate, I sort of thought social work and real estate. But I mean, you guys know this because you're realtors um, and you've been working with clients for a while. The personal, the people part is huge. I mean, that, and that's what social work, that's what you learn how to do is to interact with people. So it actually was a, a great educational background. Um, but the reason I got into real estate is an extremely personal one. Our son Oliver was um, diagnosed with a rare genetic disorder when he was 19 months old. And the way he was diagnosed was also incredibly dramatic. So one Sunday morning, we couldn't wake him up. I remember I was like sitting up with my coffee. I was writing thank you notes. Um, and I thought he slept a really long time. And I went up to check on him. Um, and he was kind of he wasn't unconscious, but he was kind of asleep and not really awake. And I didn't think much of it. I mean, at this point, I think I have a totally healthy kid. Um, but I bring him downstairs and he's continuing to act a little weird, won't take his bottle, won't drink the milk. Um, and so we call my brother-in-law, who's an ER doctor. And he says, you know, I mean, it's not a big deal. I'm sure, you know, try to wake him up, you know, maybe um, jostle him a little bit. Babies can sleep really deeply. But as time went on, it became clear that something was really wrong. And at about an hour mark, he began to have seizures. And it was very clear to us that's what was happening. And of course we were completely freaked out because we had no idea what was happening. Our next door neighbor happened to be a doctor at the time. And so she ran over and she said, you need to call 911. I mean, her face went white. And, and I think you guys know this, like when a doctor is freaked out, you should absolutely freak out. I mean, there it's really concerning. And so um, we called 911, which I've never done. I stood in the street because the, the houses in our neighborhood look a little bit similar. Um, and Oliver was life flighted to Chapel Hill from New Hanover Hospital, which is here in Wilmington, North Carolina. And we were told to call all of our family. We were told that he had potentially a brain bleed and that he could pass away. Um, it was terrifying. There aren't words for it really. I, I talk about this, I, I got to give a TEDx talk and I remember standing on the helicopter pad and if you've never had a loved one life lighted, I hope you never do, but you can't go with them. And so to have your tiny baby's body on the stretcher through a chain link fence, to feel the ground that literally shakes and the wind is whipping your hair. It was, I just remember thinking like I had no frame of reference, no context for something um, this overwhelming. And so once we got to Chapel Hill, we got some really good news, which is Oliver did not have a brain bleed and he didn't need to have surgery and he wasn't in imminent danger of losing his life, but he had a rare gen genetic disorder called tuberous sclerosis complex. And my husband does too. And we have a 50% chance of other children having this disorder. I was 28 years old. My life just completely turned upside down. At the time I was a stay at home mom, had planned to get back into social work, ease into it part-time to full-time eventually, thought that we would have one or two more children. And over time, as Oliver's care began to escalate, the seizures continued. We began to see doctors in Boston and Chapel Hill. He was 
He used to could sing and could say five word sentences. He's nonverbal now. He began to lose all of these skills. So we were frantically searching for solutions for him and the medical bills were piling up. And I think you guys know as a social worker, I was not making a lot of money. Um, I would do some contract work here and there, but it clearly wasn't gonna pay the bills. Um, and my husband had been a realtor because he helps his brother with some rental properties. And he had always said, you'd be so great at real estate. And I was a little offended because, um, you know, as a social worker, I wanted to be like Mother Teresa. And, you know, I sort of had this bad, um, unfortunately, um, perception of salespeople. And I think, obviously, now that I'm in real estate, I don't anymore. I understand it. And I think that there, um, unfortunately, there are a handful of people out there that can kind of skew perceptions. Um, but it was a huge opportunity. And I think you guys understand this. I mean, I literally was thinking um, that helicopter bill when I got it, it was $17,000 for one life flight. Our insurance eventually paid it, but it took almost a year. And so in the meantime, I mean, we didn't know what to do. And um, I was like, well, I could sell, <laughs> this is gonna be recorded on Facebook Live. Anyway, whatever, you know, I'm joking. But I was thinking I could sell drugs or houses. I'm not gonna sell drugs, don't worry about it. But I was trying to think about something, like how can I do something for my family quickly that will give me flexibility? I couldn't think of anything else. And certainly knowing Andrew's experiences, I was like, okay, I'm gonna give it a shot. And from the moment I got in the real estate class, I was like, I found my tribe. This is kind of crazy. I love this class. I love that there are so many options. If I want to work 60 hours one week and six the next, if I want to go to a conference, if I want to invest in coaching, I don't have to ask anyone. I can do all of this. It was so life-giving. I mean, real estate really saved me from a mental health perspective. When I was a stay-at-home mom, I mean, all day, every day, it was tracking seizures and what's happening and so much stress. And so to be able to go and show properties and help people, um, you know, close on a house, like see something from start to finish and then doing what coaches tell you to do, like, you know, the basics, like make X amount of phone calls and X amount of contacts, like it worked. And with Oliver, nothing worked. Everything we tried didn't work. He had a brain surgery. They literally took out um, his left temporal lobe and part of his frontal lobe in Boston. Uh, these are doctors who teach at Harvard. They're fantastic. They've taken care of us for a long time. 50% um, chance he would not have another seizure in his life, except 26 hours after the surgery, he began to seize again. And his brain was gone. Like you can't put it back in. It's a huge decision. And so for all the things personally that just were not going as planned, professionally in real estate, I found such comfort in the processes, in other people already knowing how to do it and that I can learn from them. And so um, I share all that with you to say my self-care journey, I think um, you have some context for it. It's critical for me. Self-care isn't selfish. It's strategic in my life. It's strategic for you. If you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of the people who are counting on you, who love you, who need you. And it's a lot of people if you actually count it up. Um, I'll fast forward to today so I make sure that I don't tell, like, don't miss telling you about Oliver because um, sometimes when I'm talking, I, I leave off what's happening now. But he's doing well right now. He's 11 years old. He comes up to here on me. So he's, he's about five feet tall. My husband's very tall. They say that Oliver's going to be six foot four or five. So he's going to be a big kid. Um, he's very joyful. Um, he was diagnosed with cancer in um, 2018. We thankfully caught it early and he had a surgery. We did not have to do chemo or radiation, but of course we have to keep an eye on that. Um, it's crazy <laughs> to be a cancer mom too. Like we've done make a wish, we've done cancer, we've done the brain surgeries. It's just completely overwhelming, honestly, the whole experience. Um, but it's taught me a lot. It's taught me how to be grateful for what we have, how to see beauty out of ashes, to be in a hospital room and know there are still things you can be grateful for. I'll tell you <clears throat> in any hospital, two things that are awesome, crushed ice, it's the best. And heated blankets, like where else in the world can you get a heated blanket? It's the best. So those are things that I love about the hospital. There are plenty of things I don't, but, but trying to see the comforts, the kindness everywhere is an important way um, to live. Also, you have to learn to face reality. I think a lot of us are very, very good at denying things. So we don't want to see the hard stuff. But when you have a kid who's sick and who's medically fragile, you're hit with that almost every day. And that's helpful. It grounds you. It helps you not get too full of yourself. It helps you not um, begin to worry about things that don't matter. Like you, you know what the small things are and you know what the big things are and you don't get them mixed up. 
So Oliver's doing well right now. We are homeschooling him. He has now been diagnosed with a mitochondrial disease as well, um, which is just statistically almost impossible. His kidney cancer is related to tuberous sclerosis, but like 0.1% of people get this kind of kidney cancer. So, you know, go figure. Um, that's why we do preventative scans though every year with him. And that's how we caught it so early, which is why all of us need to take care of our health, which I'm going to get to. So um, overall doing well this morning, he was doing well. He loves to jump on his trampoline. We are still listening to Elmo songs and Yo Gabba Gabba, um, still reading Llama Llama books. Um, but, but it's, um, it's a simple life with him and it's, it's really precious. I mean, when you have a kid with autism, they, they don't give you a hug unless they want to, like they have to want to. Um, and so it, it's just precious when he comes up and gives me a hug or a kiss, because I know it's coming from his heart and it's not because he needs to, or he wants something. Um, so that's our story with Oliver. My husband, again, Andrew works mostly in the film industry now, sometimes in real estate. And we have about 60 hours of care um, that we try to staff for Oliver each week. And it depends on what's going on with him health wise and what he needs. Um, he's on 14 medications. Um, he is fed through a feeding tube for the most part. He is still in diapers. Um, so again, my self-care is very serious. I mean, I, I have to stay healthy for him. And so in that context, we will, we will move on to this idea of self-care. Um, and I generally print out my notes, but my internet broke at the office. And so I have that on my computer screen. Um, one of the things before I dive into the sort of the content that I have for you today that Debbie and I talked about that she wanted me to bring up is this idea of incompatible wishes, meaning if you want to be like the top salesperson in your brokerage and you have a reasonably uh, large brokerage, that means you're going to have to produce at a really high level. If you also really want to take, you know, time off to, um, I don't know, spend with your family to go on a vacation that's super long to do um, maybe some of that self-care balance thing that we're talking about. Those things can be really incompatible. And I think we're often sold this idea that we can have it all. And it, you you just can't, you have to make choices. You know, um, I love this Jack Welch quote, which says um, something like, I'm going to butcher it, but he, he talks about there that it's not work-life balance, it's work-life choices and you learn to live with the choices that you make. And so um, the book that this idea of incompatible wishes comes from is called Necessary Endings. It's one of the best books I've ever read. I think I've read it three times. I'm gonna recommend a few books as we talk and hopefully um, somebody can drop the links in there. So again, Necessary Endings is an incredible book. If you're a leader, if you're just a person, we are taught how to start things. We're taught how to recruit people to our team, how to train them. But what about when it's over? Whether we want it to be or not, how do we end things? When do we end things? When is the right time to do that? And how can we be empowered to do that? And that's huge because one of the things that I know you guys are going to experience more than the average audience that I talk to is, is a lot of you are in leadership and it's emotionally draining and it can be lonely. Um, I was uh, talking to the girls, uh, the ladies in the Inspiration Lab last night. We have a small business squad. It's for small business owners. And we were talking about sort of that stress that comes when you are thinking about your organization, like you're the only person in your life, probably, that understands your business like a chessboard, meaning if you move one piece, what is the second, third, fourth order consequence? What are the relationships, the dynamics, the history between people, between organizations? That is a hard and heavy thing to carry. And I don't want you to minimize that because it's real. And it is something that you really have to learn to address. You cannot pour out of an empty cup. And if you feel empty right now, you cannot lead in the way that you need to. And so that's so much about what self-care is about. It's not massages and bonbons and like silly stuff like that. I, I mean, I sort of wish that's how self-care worked, but self-care is about a disciplined practice and it's building into your life into a routine. So we're reflect. You don't have to think about it. You're just sustaining your life with something, um, that feels like a healthy rhythm. I don't think, I think balance is a myth. I mean, that's crazy. Who can achieve balance? Who wants to? It takes too long, right? Rhythm's perfect. Real estate's really busy for us right now in Wilmington, North Carolina. And so I'm working a lot more than I normally would. Gen generally in January and December, things are a little quieter. I'm spending more time with family. I'm spending more time at home baking. There's a rhythm to my life. There are seasons and I'm okay with that. I'm embracing that. I'm not every day trying to keep things in some perfect, um, balance. And I, I think if you've 
been trying to do that, man. That's a really, it's a really hard thing to, to hold together. Um, so I use this balloon metaphor because my first um, self-care tip for you guys, or kind of the first thing I want to share with you as business owners, and really this is for anybody, honestly, it's so counterintuitive and it's so hard to do. Okay. I, I, it's not natural, but it's the secret to getting through this life and getting through it well. When you're stressed out, as your stress is going up, your self-care practices need to go up equally, right? Generally what happens is our stress level goes up and our self-care goes down. I mean, we don't, we don't even know when we last took a shower, right? And so we have this seesaw effect. That's not sustainable. That's called burnout. And I know a lot of realtors, as you know, who have burned out or had a really terrible diagnosis or, or frankly burned up relationships with people they love. That is not what we want, right? And so the, the way to deal with the stress in your life, because here's the thing, I'm not here to tell you your life shouldn't be stressful. Like my life is very stressful and I can't do a whole lot about it. Oliver's health is a moving target and almost every day something is happening with it that's stressful. I mean, if I go to a doctor and they say, get rid of stress in your life, impossible. Also, I'm a realtor. Like, have you, have you dealt with a, a angry client recently? Have you had a buyer? I mean, have y'all noticed that buyers are, they're just looking at Zillow and looking on their phone and looking at real estate ads all the time. And so there's such a, um, a speed at which people are interested in, in sort of hearing back from you. I mean, it's a demanding career. It's relentless. It's competitive. So we're going to be stressed. So let's just like accept it. Okay. What do we do? When, we, when we're stressed, we step up our self-care practices. And these are self-care practices that are, for the most part, very um, free, like completely free. You just have to do them. And that is how you sustain it, right? I mean, if you were going to run a marathon, you would want to drink water and hydrate throughout the marathon. You would never think that you could drink enough in the beginning to get all the way through to the end. See, I think so many people so many real estate agents, and I mean, I've done this before, but I mean, and it's not sustainable. You're running your life like a sprint. It's cool to sprint at certain times, but you can't sprint the whole marathon, especially when you have chronic stress going on in your life. It could be from a loved one. You might have a chronic health issue yourself. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know the kind of burden that you're carrying, but I know you can't sprint the whole way. That's how you break yourself and make yourself sick. Um, and so it's really key. Stress goes up, self-care goes up, right? You're going to try it. You trust me. I'm going to tell you how to do it. But does that make some sense when you stop and think about it? But you realize how it's not super logical. It's not the thing that we naturally do. And yet it's the thing that could be best for us. Um, I want to check in with, with Debbie or Bill. And uh, I've been yakking for a long time and want to see what y'all think about that and if that resonates a little bit. Yeah, absolutely, Stephanie. I look at that, you know, I'm taking notes as you're speaking, as I always do. And, you know, perspective is everything. And when you think about that self-care being a strategy, these are the keywords I wrote down, strategy, discipline, and rhythm. And, and you're absolutely right. We, we tend to, as natural overachievers, which a lot of real, the majority of real estate agents are, we think we can just keep going, just keep, take, just keep giving, just keep, you know, and and you're right, you are sprinting. And so for, for the, my big take homes is that, you know, what is the strategy? What is the discipline? And what is the rhythm? And how do you start with, like, how do you start incorporating that with small steps? Because again, for me to say, okay, overachiever, I'm going to go create a strategy of discipline and a rhythm, and I'm going to go all in. And then there, this other, it's the seesaw. There goes everything else, right? Um, so the baby steps, what are some of those baby steps to start implementing? Um, for that self-care. Well, it makes total sense to me because I mean, I'm that way too. I'm like, okay, tell me, I want to make it hundred percent work. I want all the tips and tools and I want to be there. And um, I think if we remain teachable and we try to start with something that's realistic, you, and we know this in real estate, right? If you have a team and you recruit someone, you need little wins, right? I mean, you want them to get that momentum and begin to feel positive about the real estate industry. And it's critical, right? If you throw them into the deep end, they're going to drown. It's going to be terrible. Self-care is the same way. You're trying to get yourself little wins that begin to, to really have some impact on your life. And so I'll unpack that because yeah, there are lots of baby steps that you can take and you just, they seem obvious, 
but you're not doing them because if you were, your life would be totally different. I can guarantee you that. And so the cool thing is like, it's free and you can start today. Like you can start tonight on these things. And I think that that's really cool. Cause for me, I had to have something like realistic. I can't go to the spa every day. Like, do you know what I mean? There's so much of the self-care stuff. That's like, it's self-indulgence, honestly. And I'm not interested in self-indulgence. I think that can be selfish, you know, I mean, do it from time to time, but I need, I need self-care. So I think there's kind of like, I want to make sure we're talking about the, the right things, you know? Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Well, let's dig in on that. Dig in on the self-care tactics for us, Stephanie. Okay. All right. We'll talk about what comes next. So um, this is um, specific to business owners and, and real estate agents or anyone who leads a team, okay? You need to have, you need to have thinking time, like time to think. Okay. There's a book I love. I don't know if y'all have read it. I almost love it as much as necessary endings. I don't know. It's like a tie. It's called the road less stupid. And, um, it's by Keith Cunningham and his entire, the entire book, it's actually, the book's pretty short because most of what it is, is questions. Um, he's trying to get us in the discipline of ideally once or twice a week, but let's just start with once a week, uh, or once a month thinking about our business. And, and the idea, the principle behind thinking time is really cool. It's that you think about the one question for hopefully about 40 minutes uninterrupted. Like you go use the bathroom, you get your drink, you need to find a place in the world. I don't know if it can be in your house or in your car, like park in a, the back of a, a grocery parking lot or something like find somewhere where you're not interrupted and keep thinking and keep writing. And so one of the things you'll notice, it's sort of like meditating, like your mind will kind of go off on these tangents, but you keep coming back to the question and you keep coming back to the question. And he says this in his book, and I found this to be so true that in the final kind of third uh, portion of that kind of 40 or 60 or 30 minutes, you get some really incredible breakthroughs because so much of what you need is within you. Like, you know, the chessboard. Nobody else does. Like, have y'all ever tried to get advice from a mentor or a coach or a friend? And you're like, actually to explain the context of this would take two hours because you can't even really give me advice unless you understand the picture. And so because it's so time consuming, the more complex your life, your business, your organization gets um, to get real helpful advice, unless people are involved in your business very frequently, that falls to you. But it's also so fun. I love, love on Saturday mornings when I have a thinking time scheduled. Recently, I've only been able to do about once a month because I, we've been having new caregivers for our son, Oliver, but I love it. I love to come to the office. Sometimes I sit in my car if people are in the office and just think about an important question. And it's incredible the insights you can get if you will just stay focused. And I think you all know this, there's a ton of research about how distracted we are, about how we cannot think deeply. And then if you actually in 10 years are able to still think deeply, like think about one thing for an hour, you're going to be so different than most people because we are wired for distraction. Um, I'm looking at my phone right there. Um, we have this thing, which I don't know if they've shared with you and if they haven't, we'll send it to you. We have a digital detox guide. So we in the month of August with our Inspiration Lab um, organization, we did a digital detox challenge, one for a week and one for a weekend to just go completely away from the digital world. No TV, no phone, um, to go back to tactile things like books and cooking and bike rides. And to really just make sure that we hadn't lost that part of ourselves, but also to, again, free up your brain to think deeply. We know there's tons of research and I, the numbers are all over the place, but if you get interrupted in a train of thought, it's very hard to get back on the tracks, right? And so you have to build this into your business. It's free. If you do it, your business will change, but you have to build in the discipline. Like it's, I know it sounds strange that your self-care strategy is to sit alone and think. I mean, Keith, who wrote the book, like he actually puts his hand over his eyes so he doesn't like look way. I didn't feel like I had to go that far, but really turning off my phone, getting my drink, getting all my little things ready. So I have no excuse, but to sit and to think and to think and to think it's just awesome. And then I distill my thoughts. I handwrite them. Cause I think that, I mean, there's a lot of research about that. And, um, and then I distill them. Most of it's junk, but there tends to be like four to five incredible nuggets. And there are some insights, some clarity, um, that I really needed. And so put thinking time on your calendar that's not the thing you can do tonight. I'm going to tell you some things you can do tonight. Um, 
and we'll come back to that. So I'm going to scroll down the five principles of self-care that we teach everybody at the Inspiration Lab, which by the way, I don't think I told you guys the story of that. So I started in real estate and I started an independent brokerage called Linear Property Group. And we have about seven agents. We just merged with Intracoastal Realty. They're the largest, largest independent brokerage in Wilmington. I mean, we closed in early uh, February. We, we put the deal together um, really in a, a pretty quick uh, transition for us. I love Trey and Jim Wallace. They, they have created an incredible organization. And in the pandemic, I am so thankful so thankful to have the layers of protection and support that we have. I still feel like we're a team with our little, um, you know, spaceship, but if we need to go to the mothership, we have one. And it's just been a huge blessing in my life. Um, so that's the real estate sort of story. But I started my own brokerage, frankly, because I, I felt like at the time I couldn't find the right fit for what I was looking for. I really wanted a place that would give people a family first opportunity while still achieving results. And I needed that just because my life I mean, Oliver's in the hospital a lot. Like, I just can't really, I don't know what's going to happen with him medically. So I had to build a team that was really a team that was cross-trained and would work that way. Um, so that's Linear Property Group um, and our team today. And the Inspiration Lab really came from this idea of going to a bunch of real estate conferences and hearing a lot of people talk about work-life balance. A lot of them on stage were, frankly, people, for the most part, guys who were married to women who, who stayed at home and took care of their children. And so you know, advice would be get up at 5 a.m. and from 5 to 7, you can write the book you've always wanted to write or have your thinking time. And I just, I, I, that's not an option for me. I swear the earlier I get up, the earlier my son Oliver gets up. Like, it's like he can hear me. I mean, I'm moving so quietly upstairs and it's, and it's like, you know, I try not to stuff on the place where it creaks on the floor. <laughs> I'm like tiptoeing over. And it's like, he's got this sixth sense. So I would say like probably three maybe two or three times a week, I actually have some time to myself early in the morning. Um, and so that's not a sustainable practice for me. It's great when it happens, but I can't plan on it. In addition, I really, I wanted people to talk about the physical manifestations of stress from real estate. People were talking about all this professional shiny stuff and none of the personal stuff. Like the people on stages I knew well, I knew that their marriages were in a hard spot or that their health was falling apart or that their team was falling apart because they were overwhelmed with that. And so I wanted to be able to talk about personal and professional at the same time. Like you're a whole person. You bring your whole self home. You bring your whole self to work. Like, I mean, like that's a social worker in me saying like, that. I'm not half of Stephanie here and half of Stephanie there. Like I'm bringing my, all of my experiences to real estate and I'm bringing all of my real estate experiences um, inside my brain and heart. I'm thinking about my clients. I, I want them to be successful. I'm thinking about the team. And so that's where the Inspiration Lab was born from. Started as a luncheon series, talked about different things, had local women have always wanted to use the spotlight and platform we have to shine a light on women who often are just not seen, but are incredible and have awesome stories to share. So now we have a membership community of over 300 women around the country. Actually, a lot of them happen to be realtors. We had um, a realtor, uh, a women's real estate conference last year connected to our other conference. Um, on, and we think it was, I think it's the only one on the East Coast, which is crazy. <laughs> I mean, like, how is there not a women's real estate conference on the East Coast? It's just mind blowing. So I was like, well, let's make one and let's see what happens. And we did. And it was really cool. And a lot of the conversation, in fact, my opening keynote was the juggle is real. Just really talking about this, this real sense of, of what we're digging into, um, which leads me into this thought of energy management. So that's the first thing in our self-care workbook. If you, if you download it and hopefully they'll give you guys the links to that as well. Um, Energy is key. I, I did not pick time management on purpose. So everybody has the same amount of time. We all know this, right? Um, but people have very different energy levels. And if you have really high energy, you can get done so much more than the average person in a shorter amount of time. You're focused, you're energetic, you feel good. Your mind is clear. It's such a powerful strategy for self-care. You need to manage your energy. And the number one way that you can do that is sleep. So I've really gotten crazy geeking out on sleep. I'm so fascinated by all the things that it does for us, for our brain, for our health, for our marriages and relationships, like how sort of emotionally you have such a shorter fuse when you don't sleep and how critical that is. And so um, I would say tonight, if you are not sleeping well, which we know is something like 90% of Americans, you need to take a first few steps. 
So I don't, we don't need to start with something crazy. Like you can't have caffeine after two o'clock in the afternoon. Although I mean, I've gone all the way. I've done all these things, but start slowly. The first thing you can do tonight is get all of the lights out of your room. Like anything that's blinking and glowing, even your um, fire alarm, you need to put something over it if it happens to be in your room. As you know, the worst light in the world to have in your house at night is blue light because it, it makes your body think that the sun is rising. Red light is better. Like if you have to have some kind of light or something blinking, it's so much better if it's red because it mimics the sunset. Um, so get your room dark. And then if you can turn the air to 70 to 68 degrees. So most people are sleeping in an environment that is warmer than your body is accustomed to. Those are two easy things you can do tonight that are relatively free. And it's the first step to your sleep journey. There are so many more steps that you need to take but if you're not sleeping well, it's, it's the foundation of health. I, like, trust me, if I had a crystal ball, the amount we're going to learn about sleep in the next probably two to five years is going to be mind blowing. And so I think that that's a huge step that you can take. It's simple. It's easy. And we know we're more creative or nicer people. And we have a lot more energy when we're sleeping well. Um, let's see. So for me, a few of the ways that I like to increase my energy, including sleep, is water. So we all need to be drinking way more water than we are. It's kind of hard to overdo it. In fact, you can't really overhydrate, which is cool. I know this from my son, Oliver, because hydration is a huge issue in mitochondrial disease. In fact, it's literally the number one thing his doctor told us to do. She's an expert in mitochondrial disease in, in children, which is actually very rare to find. And it's like, anytime there's an issue, she's like, Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. It's like the most important thing that we can do for his body to heal itself, sleep and hydration. And then also music for me is so powerful. Like you can, it's free. You need to be in a good mood. You need to get hype. You got to make a call. You're going on a listing appointment or you're feeling kind of down. You need to write something sort of emotional and moody. I don't know. Music is going to be your key. I mean, it unlocks so much within you and it's free. And I think for a lot of us who have pretty demanding forward-facing jobs, even in an office or at home. Like my car is my sanctuary, my minivan, which I love. It's like a spaceship. I can sit there and I can listen to music. I can ride with the windows down around town. Like whatever I want to do, that for me is key. And one of the things I want to hit on energy management, um, and we probably won't be able to get through everything on, on the call today, but one of the things on energy management that's key, and I talk about in my, um, the juggle is real talk is transitions. So Brendan Bruchard wrote a book, High Performance Habits. Don't know if you guys have read it. It's, I can't see the comments. So I don't know if you're like, you know, in the chat box, like I love him, I've read it, but it's a great book. That's my third book recommendation. Um, and he talks a ton about transitions. And so in real estate, I think it's the hardest issue we face truly is the transitions. So the phone rings, let's say that you have a seller um, who is, um, I don't know, really upset and offended about the lowball offer that you have and wants to talk through that. And then you pick up the phone and it's your kid's school and your child has misbehaved and you're gonna have to go pick them up, okay? So you just pivoted from like one stress to the other. And then you've got a call with somebody you wanna recruit on your team. So you need to be warm and friendly and engaged and focused on them, except you're thinking about, oh my gosh, how am I gonna deal with this seller thing? And then is my kid gonna get kicked out of school? Like these transitions and the ability to manage one from the other is key. The way I like to think about it is, take like, you know, um, storage units. You've seen these on TV, like storage wars, right? For me, I mentally sometimes have to think about pulling down the door on real estate or on my son or on whatever I'm thinking about COVID-19 and switch to the other thing, to be fully present in the moment, which is so key. But you know how you know you're burning out? You know how the self-care, you know, the self-care thing isn't working or it's not nearly enough. It's when the like the door starts just coming open and you can't stop it. So you're in the middle of a conversation with somebody about someone else and like Oliver's health door just starts coming up. And it, like, I can't get it back down because I'm so worried about it. I'm so um, concerned and can't figure out how to manage everything. And so for me, at least when I can't compartmentalize in the way that I've learned how to do, I think we all have had to learn how to do in real estate. That's a key to me that I have not had my stress and my self-care line up. I might have thought I did, but I haven't. The other thing for me is migraines and headaches. They're almost always stress-related. I love how many people in the world think that like 
their chronic back pain is not related to stress or their IBS is not related to stress. I mean, we autoimmune disorders are highly related to stress. It doesn't mean that they're not real. They're very real. Like we have to take this more seriously. Here's another book. This is number four or five. Um, the Body Keeps Score by Vessel Van, Vessel van der Kolk. He um, is fantastic and talks a lot about how your body, especially trauma, um, internalizes it and that your body does keep score. And so we need to be mindful of these things if we want to perform at our highest level. Um, in a different book that's really great called um, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, um, you probably, I don't know if you want to read it, it's super um, geeky and, and very like detailed from a biology standpoint. But what it talks about is that when a zebra is chased by a lion, right, let's say it's, you know, she's running, either the lion does one of two things, it eats her or it doesn't. So if she is not eaten by the lion, eventually her body physiologically comes all the way down to baseline. When is the last time you've come all the way down to baseline? Do you even know what your baseline is? Could you find it if you needed to? And this question for me personally is why I had to do the digital detox. I, I didn't know what my baseline looked like. I honestly couldn't tell you what I was even trying to get to. And so this is key for you. Baseline is like, where is your body when it's healthy and flourishing? I'm not saying you have to be in the best shape of your life, but like you're at equilibrium. There, there's, there's a kind of... Um, all around sense of, of um, peace and calm in your life. Again, not that everything's perfect, but I think you guys know what I'm talking about. And if you don't know what that feels like and how to get back there, how much sleep you need in order to get to that place or, or what your body needs to get to that place, you got to figure it out. And for me, I had to turn off the noise to get back in touch with that. I, I was telling Debbie, we both love Bald Head Island and we went last year for July 4th. I've not taken a week vacation since I've been a realtor, which I'm, I'm, I'm really sad to say that because um, it's a real bummer. Part of it is driven by Oliver's care and not really being able to get away um, that frequently. But also I love to work. I mean, I'm a workaholic. America makes workaholics cool. It's like the only kind of like addiction in America that we like, we idealize. It's like, you know, keep pushing, hustle hard. Like the hustle culture has gotten way out of control in my opinion, way out of control. Sometimes we have to give ourselves a lot of grace. Anyway, I digress. Back to bald head. So this digital detox thing for me was huge. So I got two phones last summer um, because I couldn't figure out how to stop the noise, but there, I have to be available for Oliver, like all the time, unless I'm in the house with him. And then I have a monitor. So, I mean, there's no point at which I'm untethered to, to, to his health. And so the two phones has been huge for me because I can turn my everything phone off and literally my emergency phone, um, Oliver's workers, all of his nurses and workers have it. My assistant and Andrew, my husband has it. No one else has, has the phone number. And it's so life-giving for me to go on a walk or do whatever I need to do and know that I can turn off the noise because we have the power and the ability to do that. And that helps me get back to baseline because sometimes my text message threads feel like whack-a-mole. I mean, like there's so many little details embedded in these threads. You're just like hitting one and then another pops up and you're like, oh my gosh, we we got to get the seller's net sheet for this one like listing. How, how did this fall through the cracks? Where is it? Is it sitting in a file? Is it on an email chain? Like that kind of stuff in your brain, it takes up room. And so being able to digital detox and to get away from all of that noise, I think is just absolutely critical to help you find your baseline and come back, right? You have to come back down. You have to feel that release. And I mean, it's not just Stephanie. I mean, there are doctors and people who know way more than I do. America is just popping at such a high frequency. We're so far from our baseline, we don't even know what it is. And part of that is our consumption of media 24 seven. You're never gonna watch a newscast and feel better about the world and more calm, you're just not. And so if this is something you're struggling with, I, you have to think about all the things that you're consuming. What are you putting inside of your mind, your body? What are you listening to? What are you seeing? Is it making you smarter? Is it making you wiser? Is it making you kinder? Like are Whatever you want to be is what you need to watch and consume and, and bring into your life. Um, so that's energy management. It's absolutely key. Um, gosh, we don't have a whole lot of time. So I'm going to plow through these really quickly. Priority management's key. I think you guys are part of an awesome coaching organization. I'm sure that they've taught you way more about priority management than I can. But if you have a lot of energy, that can make up for a deficit in time. But if you're not doing the, same, the right things, so you get to work and you're jazzed up, you had a great night of sleep, you're super hydrated, things are in a good spot for you, you've got your phone turned off, you're ready to work, but you don't 
know what the first thing is you're supposed to do, you don't know what goal is going to get you the, the best result, then that's a problem. So here's another book recommendation. Um, it's called Failure to Implement and Howard Partridge wrote the book. Um, I'm not super familiar with his work, but I heard a story brand podcast with Donald Miller and my small business squad that I was telling you guys about earlier. We have about 42 women in the Inspiration Lab that own businesses and kind of run the gamut um, from oral surgeons to restaurants, to wedding vendors, uh, to kind of solopreneurs that work from home. Um, but this podcast is about priorities and making sure that we're focused on the right things and, the, and that we're really moving the needle where it matters the most. And of course, you guys all know um, Gary Keller's book, The One Thing, right? So it sounds easy for me to say this, but knowing what your priority is and then doing it and then being energetic so that you can get the work done, that's hard. I mean, it's easy to say this stuff. It's hard to do that. Um, we talked about how um, work-life balance is not real. It's a rhythm. If you learn to accept that, it's great. You do need to think ahead though. I'll say this for all of us. I don't know what the fall is going to look like for y'all, but I'm already feeling overwhelmed. There are so many events in September and October that have been rescheduled. Now, I don't know if they're going to happen in Wilmington or in North Carolina, but if they do, I'm already full. Like I'm pretty much booked up for the fall. So what am I going to do when, you know, we have extra clients or we have, you know, projects or opportunities that come up you need to go ahead and think ahead to build in some margin for yourself. You know when you don't have margin. It's when you're working from sunup to sundown. It's when you feel that sense of overwhelm. It's when you haven't been to baseline and who even knows how long, right? So I think we in the fall in particular, whenever we're going to get a bit of a window of a break, if we do, of this COVID-19 thing, it's going to be a grind like I think something we've never seen and a happy time too. Like people are going to try to cram every wedding, baby shower, graduation, celebration in a tight window of time. So we need to think ahead for that. Like you should not be surprised if every December you're overwhelmed. Don't make it happen this December. Don't let that happen. Like work backwards and figure things out. When do you need to put up your holiday decorations at what, by what day do you need to have all the gifts wrapped? By what day are you going to cook or order the food? I mean, don't, don't have year after year where you're surprised and it's like every April you're freaking out because you're super busy. If you know you're going to be super busy, plan ahead, right? Um, you don't fall on top of the mountain, so they say. You, you have to plan to get up there, right? And you have to have the right gear and the right plan. Um, so community obviously is key. Y'all know that. You're part of a coaching organization. But I think it's really important for you to have a peer. But a person that's got a business about the same size as yours um, especially in real estate, maybe a team, it'd be ideal if they're in the same franchise or if they're part of the independent world so that you can kind of understand each other a little bit better. It's also helpful because you can talk fast, <laughs> like you can talk in nuanced ways and you don't have to explain it. They understand splits, they understand referrals, they understand dynamics that are happening in a team. You can say ISA and people know what you're talking about, right? A true peer is absolutely critical. And I really struggled with this um, for a long time. I knew people out of town, but I didn't have a lot of women in town that had either their businesses were much larger or were legacy companies like mom and dad were still involved. So they were getting support there or they just were small and wanted to stay small. Um, so now I have a friend who has a dental studio um, and we have a lot of uh, things in common with the size of our team and where we wanna go and what we wanna do. And that for me has been life-giving. Um, that's part of my self-care is checking in with her and, she, and her checking in with me and being an intentional friend, but having a friend who's intentional back. We always initiate. That's what high-performing people do. We're always planning a birthday party or getting things moving or pulling the family together, or getting the team on the same page and doing some kind of workshop. You need a friend who can initiate back. Like you throw them the ball, they throw the ball back. I, I mean, I'm done with the relationships that are like the basketball hoop, right? You just keep throwing them in the basket and like it drops to the floor. That kind of relationship and friendship, you need those in your life, healthy, solid people who are not Pollyanna, but are positive and optimistic and can remind you to bet on yourself. When you're betting on someone or something all the time and you need to bet on you. And sometimes you need somebody to say that. And sometimes you just need somebody to say like, gosh, you're kicking butt. Like, your personal life is really challenging right now. And I can see that when other people can, or it's not appropriate to share, because sometimes it's not your story to share. You have a kid who's struggling with addiction. You have somebody in your family who's got an eating disorder. I mean, I can talk about what's going on with Oliver, but plenty of you are carrying burdens that are arguably heavier that you can't speak about. And that is hard. You need that piece and, and you need mental health too. I mean, if you don't have a therapist or someone that you can talk to, um, 
it might be something to really consider. If you, if you struggle with stress, with anxiety, with depression, with getting to sleep, if there are areas in your life that are out of whack, it's a great place to go and get a little bit of harmony for yourself. Um, for me, it's been key. I've been seeing Snowy Albright for years. She's retired now, so we just talk on the phone. But because I've talked to her for so long, actually, we went, we went to see her for marriage counseling the week after um, Oliver was diagnosed because as a social worker, I knew that the odds were against us. And I was like, we have to invest in our marriage. And this is going to be like a one-off meeting. And so every season that's been hard with him, she's there to help walk us through it. And so that relationship is so key for me. I mean, she knows all the people that work for me. She knows my family. So I can just kind of dive right in and get some support and feedback. And if you're a verbal processor, nothing better than therapy because you can you can talk for 50 minutes straight and uh, get a little feedback and sometimes get correction. I mean, Snowy will call me out and it is good because I think the more successful you are and the, the higher you go in leadership, the harder it is for people to call you out even when you say you want them to, right? Uh, so if you hire coaches and therapists, they will, they will definitely let you know um, what's going on. And so, um, so many more things to tell you guys, of course. We have really, I hope you'll come back to the Inspiration Lab for lots of things that we're doing. Um, the final thing that you can do for self-care, apart from hydrating yourself, oh, I wanna say this thing about hydration. You can drink so much more water more quickly if it's room temperature. Don't try to pound ice cold water. But if, if you want to feel better, like today, go ahead and start drinking room temperature water and at least at least just try to do whatever you normally drink, just double it. Don't get crazy. You don't need to carry around like a gal like a gallon water jug. That's unrealistic. Be realistic with yourself. Um, but start that practice too. And in the office, I just like hand out water bottles. I'm just asking people constantly, like, are you hydrated? Um, so the final thing that I'll tell you that um, Andrew and I do a lot and I've found, especially when you're under chronic stress, which all of us are, frankly, I mean, COVID-19 has put us in chronic stress, which is technically defined as six months or more of, of stress. So, so we're going there, is the can and can't control exercise, right? So you take a piece of paper, you, you draw a line down the middle vertically, you put what you can control on the left, what you can't control on the right, and what is always gonna be in your can't control column. I wish y'all could talk to me, but other people. You cannot control other people. Like, you know this, right? But it's so helpful to write that your relationship with your mother-in-law, that client that's off the rails, like politicians, people in your community, folks you don't agree with. The more time you spend thinking about your own attitude, your own work ethic, your own mindset, the actions you are going to take, the more in control that you'll feel. And it really helps. I'm telling you, if you do this, rip the sheet in half when you're done, down, down the middle, and throw the stuff you can't control in the trash. It, it's really helpful for your body to physically do that. And it's a huge exercise. It's free. It's easy. Teach it to your kids. It's one of the easiest things that you can do to start focusing on what is within your control and how you can get moving. Um, so the things we're going to have in the Inspiration Lab before we do some quick um, questions and answers, we have um, six secrets to public branding, which I'm going to be teaching in June. Um, we have a lot of women who ask, like, how do I get to, to even come present to you guys, like how, how did that opportunity happen for me or public speaking or TEDx talk and that sort of thing. And so I'm just gonna tell y'all everything I know and I could not find this information anywhere. Um, it would say stuff like have an elevator speech for your personal brand. Like I actually have never had an elevator speech for my personal brand and have not needed one. I think we, we need to help each other learn how to shine a spotlight on, especially women. We need to hear more stories. We need their voices, especially in our industry which is mainly built on the backs of working women, we need to hear, hear your stories. We need to know what you're saying. And so in order to do that, you gotta cut through the noise, right? Cause nobody's gonna knock on your door cause they heard you had a cool story, right? I mean, that's just not how it works. Um, we have our mid-year goal setting workshop called Banner Your Blueprint. And we really teach our folks um, to wrap their goals in grace. That sort of hustle culture is so damaging because you have to, um, you have to look at your goals and say like, yeah, I wanna hit this goal. But if my kid is sick this quarter, I'm gonna give myself some grace. Like there will always be houses to sell. There, there may not be these seasons with your children, with your family ever again. And so wrapping your goals in a little grace is something that's so important for, for realtors. Um, and then of course we have the digital distraction, um, digital detox workbook. And we'll probably do a challenge in August if you guys wanna join us again to try to uh, go off the grid, um, which is really fun. So. With that, I'll, I'll um, let Debbie and Bill come back and see what thoughts or questions you guys had. 
Yeah, great, Stephanie. Thank you so much for sharing that information. You know, I, I took a lot of notes. I know one thing that um, I actually attended the Banner Year Blueprint event that you had um, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. And um, that was such an amazing workshop being put with other career driven women um, to have you assess those goals from a from a priority standpoint, but then like you said, wrapping it in grace and, and it would the, the banner year blueprint was more formed around the COVID-19 that we were all um, knee deep in. And so, you know, that was some really great things and just some one liners that you had, which is so true. You know, real estate is really humbling. Um, and and that what you were saying when we were talking a couple of weeks ago was that it's the only profession where you're rejected daily and you're also ranked daily and then it's advertised. Um, yes. Like I, I was talking on that call last night with my small business squad ladies. And I was like, how about you go to your, to your like team meeting and you're ranked on a board, you know, and there's no like asterisk, like she had a hard week, you know what I mean? Or she dealt with a family crisis. It's just like you're ranked. And so the, 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 the public facing nature of real estate is a grind. I mean, it's relentless in that way. And that is something I think we have to learn how to deal with, you know, and how to cope with. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I would be fine. That's part of, honestly, when we had an independent brokerage, we never knew our numbers. Honestly, we knew our per internal numbers, but I had no idea. People would tell me like where we ranked. I was like, cool. But now that we're at a big brokerage every week, baby, my team is like, wait, wait, where are we landing on the list? And I was like, I didn't think we care about that, but now we do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too, you know, and then it's put out there publicly. I like that there's no asterisk, you know, and another thing that you said too, and I, I think this was dear banner, during banner year blueprint, um, you said, from our actions, we get the results we want or the lessons we need. And that was really impactful because I feel like you're so right. We can choose the right action or we can choose the wrong action. And we might even choose the right action and get a lesson from that too. Um, and so that I think was one of those things that uh, really stuck with me. So Bill, I'll turn it to you since I've done all the talking. What do you have takeaways or questions for Stephanie? Uh, first of all, Stephanie, thank you. This has been great. Uh, it, it's interesting to see how much of what you've talked about is in alignment with what we talk about within our group. Uh, just real quick, and then I want to come to a question to kind of lead us to wrap up. Uh, it was about eight weeks ago that Debbie and I put out a memo to our folks referencing Keith Cunningham and the road less stupid and the importance of think time as we were staring down the barrel of, of this whole thing. Uh, so I did just, to, so you're aware, Stephanie, in the comment thread, I uh, posted all the books that you referenced and then uh, for the folks who are watching this after this is over with, I'll come back and link out to the different resources that Stephanie mentioned as well. Uh, so one of the questions we always like to ask people on Thought Leader Friday, uh, and you can take this any direction you want to go, is knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently at some point in the past? Maybe it was off of one of those lessons that you learned or, or, or you look back and you say, I'm glad I learned that lesson. I don't know that, that I would actually do it differently. However, gosh, I sure did make a mistake around that thing. Uh, what what pops into your mind on that? I mean, it's because I talked about it last night because somebody had a question around this. It is when you realize that someone on your team or that the situation is happening, when you realize that a job has outgrown a person, you can't train them. There's not a skills gap. Like it, the job has outgrown them. So for me, I could never be a CFO. Like I, I don't love spreadsheets. I'm not particularly good at math. You could give me every the training skill set. I just can't, the job has outgrown my capabilities. And mm -hmm. I think especially at least the way I'm wired, like if I'm all in and you're my, on my team, like I'm all in and I love you completely. And I don't know how to like halfway do any of that. And I've gotten very confused. I think in the past of thinking like, oh, you can just sort of teach people enough or give them enough opportunity. Sometimes no, you are asking them to do something they're not capable of doing. Like none of us are going to be astronauts. Okay, there's nothing we can do that's going to get us there. And so freeing people up to say, hey, I hired you to do something and you did great. But now our organization has grown, especially on fast growing real estate teams like this stuff can change really quickly. And I think bigger businesses know how to do this. I mean, they have an HR department like we, we don't have HR. We have to have the weird conversation, you know, so that's why the necessary endings was so important. But I would say knowing when a job has outgrown a person and then acting immediately for their sake and for yours and for the organizational health, because, you know, at the point at which you've offered the different solutions and, and you know that they're not gonna be able to grow into the job. And so um, that's just been a hard lesson for me to learn. And, and um, I think that some really good people who came in doing a great job in their position, we just moved them all over the bus. And eventually um, it was kind of exhausting for them and for us. And so um, that's, that's been a hard and painful lesson because it involves people, you know? Yeah, yeah, great point. Uh, Debbie, anything else before we wrap up with Stephanie today? 
Yeah, just one little quick thing, Stephanie. Um, would love to love for you to share where they can find you, your website for Inspiration um, Lab and all of those things. How can they find Stephanie? Sure, yes. Well, um, the inspirationlab.co, because we can't afford .com, um, is where we're located right now. Um, so we'd love for you to come see us and say hello there. And I mean, I, I think if you Google me, you'll find you'll find me somewhere. And um, I would love to say hello and stay in touch. And it's so fun to meet realtors from around the country like I told you guys, I mean, real estate really saved me and the real estate industry has been so kind and so generous to us in our journey with our son, Oliver. I just have nothing but love and respect for our industry and would love to share in any way I can. Great. Thank you again for, for being here with us today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. Yeah, you too. Thanks for everything. We enjoyed it. I'm sure this is not the last time we'll be seeing each other. Uh, our folks are very excited to have you here today and learned a lot from it. So thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Debbie, for organizing all of this. This is great. Okay. Have a great weekend. Go get some downtime. Yes. <laughs> Take See care. You. Bye.